You are back with the App Show. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler. We're broadcasting from our respective home studios. Wanted to chat now about the recent announcement from Apple and Google about contact tracing. There's been a number of countries that have done that well in helping stem the epidemic. Well, uh, Apple and Google are getting into the game by actually making it easier for us and health professionals to alert uh, potential uh, victims of the uh, the virus. On the line, we've got uh, our good friend, Dr. Michael Geist. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I found this uh, to be very interesting on a number of uh, different levels. I love how technology can uh, help make the world a, a better place, but there's also some privacy concerns I want to talk about. But can you explain in layman's terms how this uh, new system is going to work? Sure. And, and I think it's almost good to take a step back because there's been any number of different proposals around how we can use technology and telecom apps and the like to try to deal with some of the, the COVID-19 concerns. And it's good to unpack a little bit what some of those are. So there have been some who have wanted to focus on location-based tracking. So the notion that um, you could use location-based tracking, either GPS or cell phone location, try to identify where you are to see whether or not someone might be violating a quarantine or whether or not based on that information, they, they may, there may be people around them that have the disease. Those raise really serious privacy-related concerns. And I think a lot of doubts as to whether or not the, tech, the technology is good enough in terms of proximity to actually identify whether something would work. What we've seen a shift to, though, is some of these proximity apps. And they would primarily, I think, rely on things like Bluetooth, that a lot of people would be familiar with, for identifying where something is in, someone is in close proximity. The idea often would be that these would be opt-in apps that people would choose to install on their phones. And if they did so, we could have the many users, so long as there were many, many users out there that chose to do precisely this, they could identify when they um, might have had COVID. And so long as lots of people are running the same, the same app, when someone comes in close proximity as defined through Bluetooth, um, it could provide them with alert that there is a potential risk involved. Well, that's the interesting uh, thing. Uh, Bluetooth only works within meters. Uh, you know, you talked about the, uh, the, the larger one, the GPS location uh, aspect, uh, basically using smartphones and cell towers, I guess, to triangulate where you know, people are or mass amounts of, uh, of people are. So uh, what are Apple and, and Google basically proposing here? Well, what they've tried to do is put together basically an API format that would allow other apps to rely upon some of the specs that Apple and Google are, 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 are producing. And their particular approach is designed to really try to provide privacy by limiting the amount of information that goes back to a central hub, say a Google or, a, or an Apple, or even in theory, a government department, if they were ultimately to be the ones that would provide it. So it's not necessarily the case that they will be the ones to run the apps, although I think a lot of people have the expectation that they may provide some of those apps, but would allow for many of the other apps that are being developed to feed into a common system and, and make it easier for some of these apps to be developed. I think there's some real promise there, but there are some perils along the way as well. I mean, we need to ensure that there's full transparency and openness as part of the stuff. It's appropriately vetted. It needs to be optional in nature. There has already been talk in some jurisdictions about essentially having the government step in and requiring people to use these sorts of apps. And of course, if that were the case, it would move away from an opt-in voluntary model, one in which government would be saying, everybody's got to do this. And so you're faced then with the question of, do I want to be tracked and walk around with this cell phone or am I going to leave the phone at home, uh, potentially feeding some risks that now uh, I might not benefit from some of this technology, but at the same time feel uncomfortable about being traced. So a lot of trade-offs uh, as part of this. And I think a lot of questions still to be answered about how this ultimately rolls out and in what fashion. How anonymous though is the information uh, that it's gathering uh, that, that they're proposing? Well, it's not necessarily anonymous if you've got it. Part of the question becomes, so some of the ways that we approach these sorts of issues where we're concerned about privacy is, as you suggest, to try to ensure there's anonymity or to anonymize the data. You put it in large pools of data. And so when it's in those large pools, any particular individual isn't identifiable. 
that brings it outside some of our traditional privacy laws, which speak to personally identifiable information and reduce or arguably eliminate in many respects, or at least reduce, some of the privacy concerns associated with it. Another way to approach the issue, though, because, of course, there is certainly going to be real personal information here, and, of course, it's highly sensitive personal information, is to ensure that no one else gets it. And so if you engage, for example, in data minimization, so you minimize who gains access, and if you also try to limit who gains access to this information, you might flush the information or remove the information uh, after it's used on a regular basis. So for example, provide tokens that are good for a single day, but then have a new token that gets generated each new day. The old information gets flushed, so to speak, and so the ability to track a particular individual um, would be significantly lessened. And so there are a number of different options out there. I think that's part of the reason why we need real testing and we need real transparency around these issues. I think you've started to see the privacy community say, well, we can see the potential for this. We also see some potential risks, though. And so part of the challenge will be, how do you ensure that you can benefit from this kind of process or this kind of app while at the same time limiting some of the potential harms. And that's focusing purely from a privacy perspective. There are an assortment of other concerns that can also arise from a more societal perspective when it comes to some of this contact tracing. And what do you mean by that? Well, I think we could identify a number of different concerns that could arise. So for example, consider we're at a time when we are still trying to convince the public especially as we begin to lessen some of the, some of the measures that we're undergoing right now, um, that they need to maintain things like social distancing, and that they increasingly need to wear masks and take a whole series of precautions, and that this is going to be with us for some time. There are fears that if you adopt an approach that says, well, as long as you've got the app, um, it's going to warn you if you're at risk. Does that lead us into an into a environment where people begin to sort of lessen some of the approaches that they take, feel more comfortable getting closer to people or discarding the mask or doing a range of different things because, well, their phone didn't buzz. And so they don't think that they're necessarily at risk. And so that potential both for a false sense of security as well as for changes in society that actually run counter to some of the messaging that we're trying to instill I think are some of the risks when we put this in. There is, you know, this tendency at times for some to look at technology as a solution to so many of our different problems. And so to the extent to which people begin to say, well, there's an app for that. I don't need uh, to wear the mask anymore. I don't need to worry about social distancing. Um, it could actually cause more harm than good. How, how do you think that the, I guess the identifier that I've had COVID in my app, is that something that the user would do or is that something that would come from the health authority or like how would that work? Because I could see there's a lot of potential for abuse there. I want to clear out the Walmart so I can go shopping, you know, right. like those <laughs> kinds of things. If the user is in charge of that or they yeah. can just turn and choose to turn it off and, and hide. Yes. Well, I mean, I, there is a, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's as a starting point, we're hoping that there is this kind of a societal recognition that we are all in this together. I'm, you know, everybody is now, uh, so many people, of course, working from home, dealing with all sorts of kinds of things that were unimaginable just a couple of months ago. Um, and so the notion that people would abuse the system for that kind of gain, one would hope we wouldn't see it, but you're right. Um, there is that prospect for misuse and abuse. And so there are trade-offs to be had. On the one hand, if you say, well, we want only the government to be able to turn on the signal, then that raises some pretty clear risks with the government now having that ability effectively to track where people are. So many of the systems that people are at least talking about in sort of a North American environment, the United States and in Canada have tended to say it's going to be on the user to opt in and it will similarly be on the user to self-identify whether or not they are someone that has had um, COVID. But you're right that one of the other harms that can arise as part of this process are in a sense false positives um, where people either don't put, don't flag themselves when they've had it Perhaps they just don't want to use the app or they don't use a smartphone or um, they didn't get the technology right or a myriad of other kinds of things. Uh, or they put it in wrongly. They say they do have it uh, when they actually don't and that causes potential chaos or 
other sorts of things within the community. And, and so I think it's important, I think, to, to as, even as we are still at a relatively early stage, so this is moving really quickly, about trying to come up with some of these solutions. I think there is a recognition that this is not kind of the silver bullet. This is certainly not an alternative to a vaccine, clearly. It is not even an alternative to some of the other kinds of measures that we need. It could prove to be a useful tool if well executed and widely used. Um, but we are still at early days to see whether or not we get there. My take on this is that this is, in a weird way, similar to like a Google Maps and you're plotting your commute and you're seeing the hotspots to avoid. Uh, that's one potential good use for this. Um, again, aggregating pers- or non-personal identifiable information, but beyond that, I think it gets really hairy as to how it's implemented, who's flipping that switch, and how pervasive use of this app is. Because, you know, we've even seen with Google Maps, that can be easily tricked by, you know, a, a red wagon full of smartphones to pretend there's a, a you know, a hotspot of activity when in fact there actually isn't. And people are bored. They're going to take any chance they can to have some fun with this kind of technology if given the chance, I think. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, and I think obviously that's, it's pretty, that it's a discouraging statement uh, on, on where we are today when we recognize that, that activities or behaviors that would really run counter to essentially uh, public, in public health import yeah. Um, are very real possibilities. But I, 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 I don't think you're wrong. I think that there's a very real possibility. And even within the community-based issue, the, the potential for areas to be flagged as high-risk areas, wrongly, potentially, um, of course, can create long-term implications and effects, not just for the individuals that live in those communities, but obviously for the businesses that are there and the like. I mean, think of restaurants or other sorts of services that are just at the cusp of having reopened, given that we envision this as sort of in a phase two kind of process, and yet they may ultimately be hampered by the potential for some of that misuse or abuse, which of course speaks to the possibility of then the government coming back into this and saying, do you create penalties um, for people that misuse some of these apps? We're starting to see, and we are seeing in many communities, including my own in Ottawa, bylaw violations for people that run afoul of what the city wants to see in terms of how we use our parks or if we violate social distancing, could we see the same kinds of bylaws or restrictions for people that misuse these apps if they become sufficiently popular and their use becomes widespread? I think we've seen enough dystopian science fiction to see what this could look like. And it's, it's unfortunate. I think yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think you're right. I think uh, it also highlights why, as part of all of this, there needs to be appropriate oversight. Um, there needs to be full transparency into what some of those systems look like. And I think we need to recognize that this is, these are truly exceptional, extraordinary circumstances, and this is not a new normal. And so the notion that we build this or it becomes built for us, and then it never leaves, even after... Um, COVID-19 does, I think, is is a legitimate concern that a lot of people have. We've got to ensure that as we build these kinds of systems into place, we also build in um, time-sensitive elements to it that basically say they are there for these limited purposes for this limited time. Um, but this is not something uh, that we would permit ordinarily um, in normal, so-called normal circumstances. We're talking all about uh, the recent announcement, uh, partnership between Apple and Google to kind of hard-bake contact tracing right into the operating systems of their phones, literally covering billions of devices uh, around the world that, you know, we all keep in our pockets. Obviously, huge privacy issues that we need to be aware of and keep on top of as uh, they roll this out. Uh, Michael, I want to thank you for joining us today. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. That was Dr. Michael Geis. talking all about uh, the contact tracing that Apple and Google will be putting into our smartphones uh, very, very soon.